collapse that occurred in the communist world. The contradiction of high taxes, heavy-handed government regulations, and welfare state policies are producing economic, social, and political crises that cannot be mitigated by the policies that cause those crises to begin with. We see this phenomenon most clearly in Western Europe. For example, because of government regulation of labor markets, unemployment there on average is about 10 percent compared to about 4 percent in the United States. In Germany and France, nearly half the unemployed have been out of work for at least a year, while only about 5 percent of Americans are out of work for that long. Few net new private sector jobs have been created in Western Europe for several decades. In the United States, since 1982, some 34 million net new private sector jobs have been added to the economy. And American workers receive higher real compensation than their European colleagues. The poor conditions in European countries do not suggest that the United States is without problems. Market reforms, for example, deregulation of airlines, trucking, rail freight, and telecommunications have produced important benefits in past decades. But other regulations have added costs to the economy. The United States also faces problems in its government-run retirement and health care systems. The statist policies in industrialized countries have produced a serious ethical problem as well. Most industrialized countries suffer under what can be termed institutional corruption. Uh, by its nature, a welfare state breaks down the separation between government and the private sector, and thus between political and economic power. Government is expected to act directly to help this individual or that sector. The public good becomes merely the good of some interest groups at the expense of others. This means that policies are often arbitrary and contradictory. In essence, the rule of law gradually gives way to the rule of particular powerful men and interest groups. Policymakers, in exchange for largesse they bestow on privileged groups, receive large salaries and offices, expense accounts, and free travel. But most importantly, they receive power to determine the economic fate of businesses and individuals, prestige for being friends of the people, and political support to continue in their positions. In such a system, businesses can prosper by purchasing favors from politicians rather than by producing products for consumers to purchase. In those systems, favors special handouts and privileges are enacted by politicians into laws and regulations. The corruption, in other words, is technically legal. Government officials and employees, union leaders, and many business elites in industrialized countries wish to avoid making reforms to their systems. It's hardly surprising that those who prosper through political power wish to keep that power. Those elites in most countries cross traditional party lines. But it is difficult for such groups to keep their status systems intact. After all, Western Europe, North America, and Japan now face competitors from Asia, Latin America, and the former communist world. Trade barriers have been radically reduced, and the communications revolution allows information and many transactions to be done instantaneously. Thus, we see that Western elites are trying to export their failed regulatory policies to less developed countries. We saw this strategy in the labor and environmental side agreements 
of the North American free trade area with Mexico. Fortunately, those side agreements have had little effect on the policies of either country. We see Western countries, through accords drawn up in Rio and in Tokyo, attempting to, to foist environmental policies based on bad science on less developed countries. Fortunately, those policies have, for the most part, been rejected by poorer countries. The leaders of those countries understand the adverse economic effects of such policies. Western elites have tended to support free trade, but for past decades we have promoted managed trade as well. For example, the United States forced Japan to limit its exports of computer chips both to America and to other countries and to accept certain portion of American uh, produced microprocessors. And we have seen cooperation between American and European officials to enforce unsound antitrust laws. Thus, the global economy in the next millennium will face two possible arrangements. Either individuals and enterprises will find themselves freer to trade goods and services with little hindrance from governments, or they could find that political controls are placed on global commerce with elites from both industrialized and emerging markets regulating the system. Clearly, a system that adds international controls to domestic controls will simply place uh, a continuing premium on political power as opposed to efficient production. The virtues that tend to emerge from enterprises in free market systems could thus be undermined. On the other hand, an open global trading system with little regulation by governments, but with competing regulatory regimes and enterprises, could create incentives for both governments and enterprises to operate in a more honest manner. For example, after initial interest, Western firms are investing very little in Russia because Russian politicians could not be trusted, extorted money, and often failed to honor or enforce contracts. Thus, Russian officials now have a strong incentive to foster the ethical infrastructure that that country needs to attract investments and to help honest Russian entrepreneurs. Further, organizations operating in global system will, with fewer regulations will have a strong incentive to cultivate a reputation for honesty. Alan Greenspan in 1963 wrote that the businessman's quest for profits, quote, is the unexcelled protector of the consumer, unquote. He added that, quote, it is in the self-interest of every businessman to have a reputation for honest dealings and a quality product, since the market value of a going business is measured by its money-making potential, reputation or goodwill is as much an asset as its physical plant and equipment." Unquote. But just as in an economy bad money drives out good, so bad government regulations drive out private safeguards. First, such re regulations undercut the value of reputation by placing honest companies on the same basis as questionable ones. And second, the public is given a false guarantee that organizations that meet arbitrary, unsound government guidelines are safe to do business with. The ethics of a polity or economy can become a topic of public discussion as happened, for example, in the transitions in centuries past to free market systems in Britain and France. The good news is that most Latin American and many other developing countries have established viable democratic processes and are now establishing the ethical infrastructure needed to support free markets and to create responsible citizens. 
entrepreneurs in those countries can help prepare themselves to be profitable in the global economy by establishing within their businesses ethical norms and guidelines that treat all employees in a fair and just manner and value workers as a company's most important asset. It does not mean copying the labor policies of Western Europe, which have harmed those, the economies of those countries. It does mean establishing clear and non-arbitrary workplace rules. It means having a system that rewards the best workers with better compensation and promotions. And for larger enterprises, it might mean establishing a profit-sharing plan that gives workers incentives to be productive. Ethical businesses both pursue their self-interest and help create the kind of responsible, self-reliant citizens that are the basis of a free society. While organizations cannot change the ethos of a society alone, they can set an example for politicians and set the agenda for public policy discussions. Such an approach would help create ethically cleaner politics, allowing organizations to operate in an ethically cleaner manner. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hudgens. Let us begin the first question and answer session. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Therefore, we ask that only one question be asked per phone call and that these questions be as brief as possible. You may call the studio directly at the phone numbers or fax which now appear on your screen. We remind you to make your phone calls at a distance from the monitor to avoid feedback. Our first question is from La Universidad Blas Pascal in Córdoba in La Argentina. It's directed to Dr. Hudgens. Dr. Hudgens, you seem to be very critical of government in general, and you seem to think that most corruption comes from government. What positive role do you see for government in today's civil society? I think the role of government is to protect the life, liberty, and property of citizens and to enforce contracts. And I think the question is important because it mentions civil society and civil institutions. There are many challenges that individuals meet in their, in their lives, but the question is, where will those challenges of life be dealt with? Will they be dealt with by the government, by bureaucrats, or by private uh, institutions, such as the family, such as churches, uh, such as uh, social organizations. It's interesting because if you look at the transition to civil societies in places like Britain and, and, and other uh, countries, uh, they developed in part from the ground up. That is to say, the government limited itself to establishing clear rules of law uh, that everyone could understand and that did not involve uh, political connections. That was crucial to have a government based on the rule of law and not political connections. In such a system, private individual organizations, private organizations such as uh, the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Organization, Sunday schools, which were church organizations, uh, immigrant groups in the United States, uh, helped to allow people to meet the challenges of life. So there is a role of go in government, but I think it's to be an honest broker, it's to have laws that everybody can understand that are enforced equally on all people and not in a political manner. Our next question is from Brazil. It is from the uh, Serviço Nacional de Aprendizagem Comercial in the state of Rio Grande do Sul, in the city of Porto Alegre, in Brazil. Muy buenos. A very interesting process that the global economies are living through is the, the internet, the emergence of internet in the in trade and commerce, in business in general. What benefits do you think this will bring the economies that are regulated by governments, and how can you concert this uh, with the ethics in a global context? Well, the Internet 
will affect economies that are regulated by government in a very positive way. That is, the Internet will create incentives for those governments to deregulate. The reason clearly is that, as I said in my discussion, uh, it's just as easy to write software in Sao Paulo as in Silicon Valley. Uh, therefore, for if the United States has a deregulated economy and Brazil has a very regulated economy, Brazil has a very strong incentive to deregulate because services such as software uh, uh, writing can be sold and transferred over the Internet. Uh, the Internet is also a system that's very difficult for governments to control. To me, that is a good thing because to me, a free market means less government control. As to the very important part of your question about how this affects the ethics of a global society, what's interesting is that you already have, especially in the United States, the emergence of a kind of informal ethos on how the Internet works. You also have the emergence of private ways to guarantee security on the Internet. For example, uh, in the United States, people can order books and uh, 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 CDs, uh, that is, uh, compact discs, music, and so forth, from different places on the Internet. Uh, people can go and bid on uh, items that are auctioned off on the Internet. But how can you ensure that if you purchase something from someone on the other side of the country, that you will get the product and they will get the money? Well, there are private organizations already developed in the United States to be brokers to make sure that if I purchase something on the Internet, I get my product and the person from whom I purchase the product gets my money. These private institutions are already emerging and I think that's going to happen internationally as well. Okay, our next question is from La Universidad Tecnológica de Netzahualcoyotl uh, in Netzahualcoyotl in the Estado de México in México. Good morning. The next question has to do with the fact that in Mexico the economic changes take place with each new president and therefore we have ups and downs in the economic indicators. So what suggestions do you have for the candidates who are going to run for the presidency for them to not have um, to, to have a smoother transitions and not to have the sectors affected by these ups and downs because of political uh, changes of government? That is an excellent question and it indicates one of the problems of a system in which political power is too centralized. Uh, in such a system, uh, depending on who is elected president, uh, the, the, you know, the economy can change in one direction or another. And in one sense, this is a, this is a, a bad thing about the system. Uh, in a system in which the economy is not controlled by government and certainly not predominantly by one individual, whether you have one person as president or another person as president shouldn't matter as much. I would like to see candidates in Mexico and for that matter in other countries pledge that they are going to return economic power and choice to the people themselves so that uh, these kinds of rough transitions will not occur. I want to give you a very important example. Uh, Hernando de Soto in Peru has written a very famous book, it's about 10 years old, The Other Path, El Otro Sinderno. And in this book, de Soto documents the problem of the informal sector in his country, where, for example, seven out of eight dwellings in Lima were constructed illegally, where some 90% of the bus transportation was illegal buses, where people had to pay bribes. And what de Soto found in his research was the reason for this was that the government was too involved. For example, to get permission to set up a, a, a business with two sewing machines took 289 days. To get a piece of land 
and to build on it, to build a house, would take six years and 11 months to do it legally. Of course, you could pay bribes and do it much quicker, but this indicates that the economy is too politicized. And I think depoliticizing the economy is an essential policy change that will help all countries. Thank you. The next question is from the Mirtha Educational Center. It's in English. It's from the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown, uh, Johnstown Pennsylvania. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Parrish Jones, and I teach philosophy part-time in uh, at University of Pittsburgh in Johnstown and do a lot of reading in the area of what's happening in our world with corporations. And you presented well the theory of corporate libertarianism, which is an attempt to ex extend the theory of libertarianism for individuals, which is what John Locke and others were proposing when they wrote that government should be limited to the protection of individual rights and property <clears throat> and the like. And this theory gives to corporations, or your theory gives to corporations, the rights that were once reserved to individuals. In the history of the United States and Western Europe, and the theory about corporations required that charters be given to corporations. Those charters were both given by the people of a state, or in most cases in the United States, by a state. <clears throat> and those charters could be removed if the corporations were found to be behaving in a way that was unacceptable to the society. But with your theory, nobody should have any restriction on what corporations do. And given the monopolization that is going on in corporations today, just look at what happened the other day with Viacom buying out CBS and <clears throat> the like. Corporations are becoming more consolidated. Services are more consolidated. Production of prod products is becoming more consolidated. Who governs the world? The corporations? or the people who make up governments. And that's something we should remember. At least in the United States, we believe that the government is a representation of the will of the people. And it appears very clearly that the people of the United States want to see the corporations regulated as regards what they can do to our environment, what they can do to us as human beings. Well, I'll, I will answer the question in t uh, several ways. First of all, I maintain that any combination of individuals should be allowed to offer any good or service that they want as long as it's voluntary. Uh, what they cannot do is what the government can do, that is, use force. For example, in the United States, uh, the U.S. Postal Service is a monopoly, and there are businesses that sometimes uh, run afoul of this government monopoly. Uh, there are more government monopolies in other countries. Those are the dangerous monopolies, the ones that's, that are supported by governments. Second, if you look at the patterns over time, you find, for example, in the United States that in the 1980s there was a lot of consolidation, a lot of businesses buying other businesses. And then in the late 80s, uh, we saw a dissipation where big conglomerates were selling off little bits of their uh, uh, of their corporations. Now we see more consolidation. These patterns go back and forth and frankly unless the government is backing a monopoly with special privileges it's not a problem. Now, the s final thing I want to say is that more and more in the United States the people are owning stock in the corporations. Who owns the corporations? It's people. It's stock owners and in the United States Retirement funds especially are more and more being invested in private corporations. So in a sense, the people are more and more becoming the owners. This grassroots capitalist revolution is one of the great uh, uh, unreported or underreported stories in the United States. Finally, remember, most of the dynamic businesses do tend to be small and medium-sized ones that then grow into big ones like Bill Gates, uh, Microsoft. If they don't stay competitive, they lose, just like General Motors and others have lost market share. Thank you. Our next question 
is from Venezuela. It is from La Universidad Central de Venezuela in Caracas. Sí, eh, sí, I wanted to ask the following question. This is a group here uh, receiving uh, the program. We, you have talked a lot about the division of ethics be, uh, from the point of view of the individual's uh, responsibility. Is there any responsibility that comes from the collect, co from collective uh, living? Is there a social responsibility? I believe, Community responsibility. Yes. I believe that the first responsibility is to treat other individuals with respect and dignity meaning let them live their lives as they wish. Uh, whether you call that a collective or corporate responsibility is a matter of definition. But after all, I'm, I admit that I'm very influenced by the situation in the United States. Millions of immigrants came to this country not because they wanted to be collectively responsible, but because they wanted to be free, because they wanted to live their lives as they chose, they wanted to uh, have their own families, their own businesses, and so forth. Uh, in the United States, people tend to be united, or at least in the past were united, by this love of freedom and a more of a mutual respect for others. Uh, each individual has to decide for himself or for herself what kind of responsibility they have for uh, uh, you know for society at large I have certain beliefs I give to certain charities I perform certain actions that I believe are in the interests of so the kind of society I want to live in but I don't believe I should force others to uh, to act in the way that I consider to be the best is Barry what do you think the question of do individuals have a collective corporate or social responsibility to the communities where they live is emphatically yes. One of the things that Dr. Hudgens had, had uh, I think, uh, spoke about a few moments ago were, was, were corporations have the responsibility to act ethically. And, you know, in the world of different uh, countries, oftentimes the government lays down the law that allows those companies or gives them the license to operate in the communities where they do business. One of the things that I think is one of the critical pieces is the environment. If you do not have environmental controls, then you have companies that act unethically. And it is the collective responsibility of the communities where those companies do business to take action. And those kind of, that kind of activism is very effective. Our next question is from the Dominican Republic. It is from the Centro de Gestión e Investigación in Santo Domingo in La República Dominicana. Good morning. I am Lourdes Peña. My question has to do with freedom. If you eliminate all government regulations altogether, what would guarantee that we are not going to translate the opportunities, the corruption opportunities, to no longer to government but to companies and enterprises that would probably use violence, not any more violence imposed by the the government, but perhaps by aggressive means like publicity and advertising. For instance, this would be a way of influ influencing and, and exerting a lot of pressure and a psychological war. And what would be then the role of government to prevent that from happening, for example? The, in, in, for your particular question, I don't think that that is a proper function of government. And I'll tell you why. First of all, I believe that most individuals are intelligent enough to listen to advertisements and to, uh, to say, well, yes, I believe this, or no, I don't believe uh, that. Uh, there's a Latin phrase, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, uh, that has been around literally since Roman times. What's interesting is that with the information revolution, false advertising, which, by the way, is, should be illegal, uh, fraud should be illegal and the government should enforce laws against fraud but with the internet and communications it's much more difficult for a business to profit in the long term by using uh, by misrepresenting its products because people get to know about these products people can go online now read about products see what customers say 
and uh, uh, reject products they don't like. I want to also point out that many of the businesses that were thought to be monopolies, private monopolies, that nobody could ever challenge, in fact, were successfully challenged. In the 1960s, the U.S. government had an antitrust case 